So welcome to the Global Discussion, discussions with creatives, leaders, and thinkers. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Kevin D. Turner. And Kevin, you're very welcome to the podcast. Let me begin by asking you to introduce yourself to our worldwide audience today. Tell us a little bit about your journey. Tell us what you focused on. Yeah. Simon, I appreciate you having me here. Always uh, enjoy our, our discussions. And most of them have been discussions right through audio events. And, and I love that, but it's even better to see you in person. So that's always kind of neat. I like that connectivity. Um, my name is Kevin Turner. I'm a managing partner of TNT Brand Strategist. Name tells you a little bit right there. We help organizations and individuals figure out what do they bring to the table and how can they position that so that others understand it and remember it down the line when the time is right, they call them, right? So that's a big piece of what I do. I've always found most uh, brands out there are made by accident, and I call it uh, personal blanding or organizational blanding, right? They just throw everything in, and they think that everybody will be able to figure it out, right? And that's just not the way it works. So my mission is to eliminate all organizational and personal blanding. That's what I do. I love that eliminating personal blanding. I think that's very, very good, yeah. Kevin. Love it. Um, I want to ask you something though, because you, you've mentioned a couple of things there. So there's sort of the personal brand strategy, and then there's the organizational brand strategy. Could you maybe just take a moment and just give us a little flavor of that? Because we see an awful lot of people with a personal brand these days in in the corporate world, in the big brand world, or maybe they're just you know, celebrities, you know, A-listers, B-listers, C-listers, whatever you want to call them. But there's a, a professional and a personal sort of brand strategy, isn't there? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, absolutely. And and the way it is now with, with most individuals, we, we have to pay our bills, right? We're not uh, enormously rich. We don't have this wealth uh, uh, that's sitting there, some uh, dowry that we've got, right? So we've got to do business. So normally, um, the professional brand is blended with the personal brand, right? And it takes you beyond just, you know, somebody who might be selling something into an individual that you might want to buy from. And so when you kind of position personal branding in that sense, it creates opportunities for those individuals. And I think that's the best way to look at it. Uh, organizational branding, companies are doing it left and right because they want their message to resonate with potential employees as well as internal employees so that they're getting that message across it's not just a uh, a couple of paragraphs on a website somewhere that helps you know guide people of how the company works it becomes part of their messaging part of their reach out and part of the understanding from people from the outside and again if they like the company they're more likely to do business with the company and so that's that's how it works no that makes a lot of sense and just for people that may may not be familiar, I mean, you've lived in the USA, Switzerland, Germany, Japan, so you've got that sort of global aspect and knowledge to it, and you've worked in, you know, Fortune five hundred. Uh, you know, you, you've done uh, the big the big companies, and you've worked with individuals, and you've also done a lot of work on LinkedIn, and it's really that I want to sort of hone into. So could you maybe talk a little bit about that? Because I know you've done an awful lot of training, an awful lot of writing. And I know you're one of those sort of five-star people that LinkedIn recommends an awful lot. So could you maybe tell us a little bit about why that's important to your strategy? And, you know, a lot of it came back from the amount of travel and the amount of places I've lived and worked with. I had people all over the world, right? And I got involved with LinkedIn in 2005 in February. I was within the first 2 million people. They actually sent us a letter, right? Saying, thank you. Now we're what, at uh, almost 900 million uh, members. It's incredible. They don't even remember any of the old guys like me. But the reason I got in was to keep connectivity with people in all these other countries and cities and everything else. It allowed a place where I could find them again, communicate with them. And I thought that was fascinating. And no other platform was really giving me that without invading their personal space. I mean, you could probably get that at Facebook, you know, that kind of stuff, but then you're getting into their personal life. And I just wanted to be the relationship that I had with them and to be able to maintain that without getting into things maybe I shouldn't know about, right? 
So that's where LinkedIn really felt right and fit. So it, be, it became your your global Rolodex, for want of a better phrase. Absolutely, yeah. and and or I would say community in in a sense. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I hate to think of people as just a, a contact or a piece of data, right? These that's are a great. People. That's a great point, Kevin. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. a great point. And I'm sure there's a good part of our international audience will have no idea about the term Rolodex because they're far too young. <laughs> but um, you know, and you're hopefully right. there's people there's... under what twenty five, maybe or thirty. They they will have no idea what that. They're all looking it up. What is a Rolodex? Exactly. <laughs> but I, I think um, I think the word community is really important there because it isn't just a connection for connection's sake. It's building that community and being able to have that discussion. And you're very good at that online. And do you, I know you've done a lot of business in a lot of countries. I mentioned some of the places where you've lived, but you've done business in about 140 or more countries at this stage. And my question is this, Kevin, do you find that when you're talking about that brand strategy that you have to tailor it for each of those countries, or do you find there are common threads running through regardless of where you are? A little bit of both, right? The one thing that, that unites all people is people. Right. And so they understand that component of it. But in that same sense, we all are very different, but embracing those differences is interesting. Right. And I always tell people, be a little different. You know, when you're a little different, it can make all the difference. That's how people remember you. Right. And they find you fascinating. And, uh, you know, to me, you were always the the audio events guy. And that was fascinating to me, you know, that you had such a passion there. So sometimes those little differences is what we do really remember those things transcend borders, right? Because we're all a little bit different. There's a beauty in that, right? Of how people are wired, what their past experiences are, their cultures. Those are the kind of things that I think are fascinating. And if people can bring those forward as opposed to trying to hide them and, and kind of, again, bland in, right? We don't want that. We want to know the true person. We want them to bring that forward. And by doing that, you can really kind of translate this across borders because people get excited about it. Yeah. And I suppose in this, you know, ever decreasing planet that we're sort of hyper connected with, you know, the sort of, you can reach people a lot easier now as the world sort of seems to appear to get smaller because mm -hmm. we can reach these countries. We can build those communities. And one of the things that I know you sort of say or state is about, you you're helping people through your work find the sharpest tools and strategies don't you for their sort of professional success how does that work in this busy always on always connected seems to be always noisy sometimes scary content world like what what do you or how do you help people with the strategy to sort of break through that noise to get that strategy that brand strategy that actually helps the bottom line and I think a lot of it is, you know, initially you've got to know what you bring to the table, right? And what you bring to the table that somebody wants to absorb, purchase, borrow, whatever it is, whatever, you know, area you're in, you've got to know that, you got to know what you bring, and then you've got to really refine that into your messaging. And, you know, that's where people forget, they, they assume we'll figure it all out. We can't. You got to simplify it. So, you know, you really get it down to two or three components that you want to be known for, right? That's going to help you get to your goals as well as help others in that process. And if you can do that and then bring it into everything you do from content that you share to, you know, podcasts, videos that you get involved with, you know, those are the kind of things that will become part of how people remember you. And so I think that's 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 the key is figuring out what those are first, right? Okay. Most people start posting, start talking, start doing everything, and they're awash in so many different topics. And there are a lot more that you and I could talk about. We might, you know, on a personal day, do that, you know. Uh, but for something like this, if you stay on brand, right, you stay in those message zones that you want to be known for, then you get the results that you need. Yeah, I, I think it's a, a great point. And, you know, this is a great example because I'm very focused on only three things at the moment, creatives, leaders, and thinkers. And that sort of keeps that strategy clear to me. And if it doesn't meet that criteria, 
as you say, it may be for something else. It, it's yeah. not for this. And I think that's really good. But you're, you're sort of using those sharp tools that we talked about to chisel away at the stuff that isn't core to the message or core to the strategy. And building on that, Kevin, because I know you've worked a lot with teams and bringing that sort of corporate culture along and helping teams grow organizationally so it, it helps with the profitability. Like, what about introducing that to a company that may be struggling, maybe having to adapt, maybe have had to go online. Um, what's that been like over the last couple of years? And how do you how do you go about sort of working with those teams that need to be high performing in today's marketplace? Yeah. You know, we do a lot with organizations in teaching them things like social selling, right? Which is a concept fairly new to most organizations. I had a background with Sony Corporation. Sony Corporation were the original social sellers. They believed you treated a customer like they were a guest in your home, right? You gave them the best bedroom, you set things up, you showed them around, you made sure they were comfortable. That's how they approach things. And, and social selling, that's a huge piece of it, right? And so I do a lot of training with organizations in that zone to get them to understand, but not only to get the sales people to understand, but to get the sales management and maybe even the corporate management to understand what this process is, why it doesn't have these kind of cold call numbers that they're always so used to, right? How do I know it's working? You know it's working when the revenue's coming in. That's that's where you should be, right? Let them do their process to get there. If they're not hitting those revenue goals, then, then we can make adjustments, right? We can figure out what they're doing, what isn't resonating, and then how to reapproach that. That's a fine tune. Once you get them past that, um, you know, that's a message that now organizations are embracing because they've, they've figured it out. People do buy from people. And so, you know, that component is something I love to teach organizations. Yeah, it's funny you, you bring that sort of social selling term, uh, which I am familiar with. You know, there's a few books floating right. around there and there's a couple of couple of companies and people talking about the importance of social selling and that that whole ethos that, what has got us to here probably isn't going to suffice in the next five or 10 years. And this move to social selling and the importance of it. Uh, but it's also nice as well to hear about how Sony approached that, you know, many moons ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I, the other thing I wanted to ask you in terms of high performing teams and building culture is uh, about um, the last couple of years, obviously, depending on where you were on the planet, you know, pandemic, uh, endemic, wherever we are now on the scale, different in each country, I'm sure. But it has been a big push into the online digital world, hasn't it? It was kind of there anyway, but that mm -hmm. was sort of the accelerant. It kind of sped it up for us. Did you find that fundamentally impacted your business? Did it change things for you? Or did it just increase the amount of business that you were doing over the last few years? Uh, you know, what was it, it like for you? It was an accelerator for us in the sense that we were already tuned to do business that way. You know, it allows you to be much more efficient, effective. If you can do these things on a digital scale, right? You don't have to fly to New York or to London or do this, that you don't waste the time in the travel and those kind of components and you can deliver. So, you know, in that sense, it was a good accelerator. The big component really came in there or the, the support of this process was the people on the other side now learned this is what I have to do, right? I have to be able to be comfortable in a Zoom call, you know, or a Teams meeting, or I have to be comfortable on a, you know, a blog post or a platform communicating. I've got to make this next step. So they're all in that process of discovering that, understanding that it is a value. And that worked in perfectly by the way we were working. So we were able to help them in that process by working that way already. So to me, it was an accelerator, really excited that it came because you know part of what we were doing was convincing organizations and people that you can do this over the phone or you can do this over Zoom, right? Or you can do it over email and text and all these digital components. And they were like, no, 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 we got to meet, right? So it took that out of the, I guess, the equation. And for us, it allowed a lot more scaling. So I think, you know, I was happy to see it because 
in that sense, people were forced forward into that kind of digital world. That's maybe the whole silver lining of the pandemic is that people did become more open to communicating digitally and I think better at communicating, right? Because people really kind of stayed back. And if I couldn't meet you in person, I didn't really know you. Now I, I look at the hundreds of people I know through LinkedIn, through events like that, that if I showed up in their country, in their town, and I knocked on the door, they would let me sleep on the couch, right? Maybe maybe the one in the garage with the dog, <laughs> but they'd, they'd invite me in. The friendship is that strong. That yeah, would it, never have happened if we hadn't all taken that leap of you can make relationships digitally, that they're as strong as the ones when you shake hands and hug people. You can do that digitally. And so to me, that was, the, I guess, the, the bright star of the process. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Kevin. It's 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 a good um, insight because I suppose a, a few years back now, people were asking the question, can you build a relationship digitally? Can it, you know, can you build a community digitally? And I think we've seen that, that there are some people that have never met today that are doing a lot of business together, whether it's through social audio, whether it's through uh, podcasts or whether it's through events or whether it's through just speaking to each other through all the different uh, video platforms that we have available to us today. And as you were saying, you know, you, you can knock on the door and you, you'll get the cat, you know, you'll be allowed to stay for the night. They, they'll know who you are. You have right? a relationship, right? Yeah, I, I get that. I get that. But it, and it also goes back to the importance of, and, and I, I don't like the word because it's blown out of proportion, is authenticity, right? If you are out there and you are not who you are, and you do have that opportunity to knock on the door, they could be like, who are you, Simon? That's not the Simon I knew. And there's a distrust, right? So you've got to be yourself. And I always say, you got to be your professional self, right? Maybe not all yourself, because <laughs> that's not always, that's not to share with the world sometimes, right? That's to share with a close, tight-knit group, it, yeah. but be yeah. your best professional self. And you know, if you stay honest to that, then those relationships do, do build. The trust is really there, just like real life. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I hear what you're saying about authenticity, because it is talked about a lot. But I think if you're genuine and you're, you're who you are, I think people understand that they can, they buy into that. Um, yeah. And you're not, of course, there are bad actors everywhere, but I think in general, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. 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 But as long as you're okay with being a little imperfect every now and then. Yeah. That's all right. And yeah. yeah, that's real. And the, the, the last thing I want to ask you on this topic, because I do want to move on and I want to ask you some other things, Kevin, but just while we're talking about this, this topic in a wider sense, I know you've spoken about and, and focused on things that you you've termed the, the the phrase disruptive advantages, and that kind of stuck out to me. Where yeah. you've you sort of have this expertise in helping people with their vision, with creating that sort of culture, creating that, as I say, that disruptive advantage. So, is that a matter of chipping away till you get down to that, or is there a particular way that you you would go about that with a an individual or an organization to get to that? nub of that what is that disruptive advantage it, i guess it depends whether they have it or not right some people you meet don't have that disruptive dis the, the, the disruptive advantage they just never have developed it but it's there their knowledge point is there or they can get there if they know what that is right that's going to make them unique put it ahead of anybody else in consideration if you can help them discover that and then refine it you know, build that into the brand and then that becomes their advantage. And, you know, that's a process. Some people you meet, you know, immediately, right? I know one of your disruptive advantages is communication. You know, that's right. key. Not everybody's comfortable with that. You are really good at that. That's something that, you know, you always want to bring into your brand is your ability to communicate, to get people involved, to get people excited, to ask the right deep questions that are going to get more response out, right? That will kind of grow the conversation. Not right. everybody's talented in that. That's, you know, so that would be a disruptive advantage for you. No, thanks. Thanks for explaining that, uh, Kevin. That's some, some great information there for our listeners. And look, just to change gear a little bit, because I want to ask you a few other questions if I can, while we've got some time together. I like to ask people about the books that they read and whether they are an audio book person, whether they like the physical book, 
whether they are just voraciously on social media and the internet. So when I ask you about your favorite books, your favorite genres, what are you reading? How do you learn? What's your learning style? How does that work for you? You know, obviously I'm, I'm on <laughs> LinkedIn a lot. I'm always digesting content there, whether it's video or, you know, post uh, process or even having conversations in audio groups and things like that. I love that. That's probably the core, but at a time, Sometimes you can over digitize your life, right? And I do like to do what I call a, a digital detox. When I do about every two weeks, usually from six to 24 hours, completely unplugged, right? Nothing digital. I will carry my phone, but my phone will be off, right? I'm unplugged. I'm not doing anything. I'm not watching TV. I'm not uh, listening to books on audio. And that's where I do. I bring out the real book, right? I might go and walk and sit at the lake. Uh, had a dog who used to go with me and he would sit with me and I would read, read three or four chapters, let the sun kind of, you know, hit you and no digital at all. And it would bring me back kind of recharged and refreshed. And so I have a mix, you know, I do like to hold a book. I don't mind an audio book as well, especially if I'm traveling, right? less likely to be able to actually take the time to do it. But I think they all give you something different, you know, in the process. Uh, so I, I, I appreciate that. And, and uh, um, part of that detox, uh, again, I do go and I read, but I'm not going to do it on my phone. <laughs> it, it doesn't get me that, that, that break that I need from, from all the digits. So the, so the digital detox, in a sense for you, is that sort of break away. It's almost something you're kind of looking forward to and you're picking up a book. So any books spring to mind? I, I actually uh, grabbed a couple. This is one of my one of my all time favorites. This is um, The Go-Giver. OK. By Bob Berg and, and Mr. Mann. What is fascinating, and you've probably heard this, that uh, people buy from and refer people to people they know, like, and trust. So everybody here says know, like, and trust. Where did it come from? Came from the go-giver. And what the go-giver, the basic principle, there's a couple of different kind of laws, you know, that you follow in this process, but it's, it's more of like a story than it is a business book, right? So you learn through the story, but what, what's interesting is it's about um, givers get, right? The more you give, the more that comes back to you. And so I, I love this book. I read it probably 15 years ago. This is the core of social selling. So to me, this is where it began. And it's always been my basis since I've been on LinkedIn is to give, but not expect anything in return, but also to be able to accept, right? And so to me, this was really important book to read. So I love that. That's, that's one of my favorites. Um, I've got a couple more that... Uh, this one you might have heard of, right? Uh, John Asperian's uh, Content DNA. What I like about it is it really, in very simple terms, kind of runs you through what do you need to do to build your brand on any platform, right? Whether it, you could actually use it for building your brand in life, not just you know on any platform. But I think he does that in a way that it's really easy to implement and remember. So I love that. I think that's a, a great book. Um, the only other one, and I'll grab it over here, um, this one, Brenda Mellers. I don't know if you've ever seen that one. Um, Social Media Pie. This one's really focused on LinkedIn. So it's got a lot of kind of basics of how do you function within LinkedIn, as she says, to get a bigger piece of the pie, right? So I like this. It gets into some more technical side of LinkedIn and, and how you do things and why it happens. Um, I have to say, I don't agree on all of it, but I like it. And it's a really good kind of uh, book if somebody's just getting into LinkedIn and they're they're kind of drowning, right? And it does happen. <laughs> so this is a good yeah. uh, primer book to kind of get in there and, and get style. Um, outside of that, I don't mind a good classic. So, you know, I'll, I'll still pull out uh, Shakespeare. Actually, that's what's underneath my computer holding it up so I can do this video. <laughs> you know, so reading Very it is uh, always a pleasure, right? 
Well, that's that's good. And yeah, John's book I know is very good. Um, the Social Pie, I, I haven't read that, but I will check that out. Definitely. Worth of course, checking. The Go-Giver and, the, you know, the backstory to that. And, uh, you know, I have heard the phrase, but it's good to see the sort of the originator of that. And because uh, we do talk about that a lot today still. Yeah. Uh, and both authors are very active on LinkedIn. So if you yeah. ever post about it and you mention them, they jump right into the conversation. And that's kind of neat too. So, you know, if you ever want to kind of build some quick momentum on a post, these guys will jump in. And what about that philosophy that you kind of touched on a moment ago, Kevin, where you just put things out there with no expectation of things coming back? Because to some people hearing that, that sounds a little bit strange. So I just I just keep doing that and I don't expect anything to return. But you've seen a huge return on that, haven't you? Absolutely. Throughout my career, not just in this kind of LinkedIn uh, component of it, but throughout my career, um, the more you give, the more people bring back to you, more people want to give you in that process. And, you know, it, it's amazing. You can give somebody all the components and you spread it over because you want more exposure, right? You give them all the components of, let's say, how to build a perfect profile on LinkedIn. All you're really doing in that process, you're giving them, you're helping them. Some people will be able to implement that, but most people go, you know what? I want the person who knows this stuff inside and out to work with me directly. And those are the people that that come to you. They're already pre-sold into you because they know you know this stuff. What they don't want to do is take all the little bits and pieces you've given them and try to make it work on their own. That's not their expertise, even though you've given them the knowledge. And so that's kind of where that happens. So it helps some people who would never come to you, right? Maybe they couldn't afford the process or that's just not how they do things. And you'll end up with this group that looks at that and says, you really know what you're doing and I want you to do it for me. And so, you know, that's been throughout uh, my career and it's been something I've been doing on LinkedIn since we first started to be able to like create articles. What was it? 2014 was our first point of creating articles. Uh, I've been doing it since then. And it does have that kind of impact that givers get. And I like that. Um, that, again, is a good, I guess, a good piece of social selling, right? Yeah, and I suppose to some degree, it helps filter the people as they come into contact with what you're putting out there. It filters the audience that you need directly back to you. And I know you've had tremendous success at that. And I, I suppose there's consistency in there too, though, Kevin, because it's not something that you did for a little while. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. It, it takes momentum, right? Anything right. does. Um, but if you stay at it and you're doing it right, and you've built your plan at the beginning, right, as opposed to halfway through, it starts to pay. And, you know, that that yeah. makes everybody happy. I like that a lot. Thank you. Um, the other the other thing that you mentioned there, because I, I do want to get onto a couple of other questions as well, but just going back to something you said there, first of all, I've taken a mental note that I need to just re-emphasize my digital detox. Um, so I, it's something to look forward to. I'm going to, because you, you made me pause and think, well, when was the last time you actually took a digital detox? And I got to be honest, it's been a while. So I need to look and at it's that. It's a joy when you do it. And yeah. you will feel no guilt because it's part of the plan, yeah. right? I love and, that. So thank uh, you for that. When you do that, it's it's fantastic. But just so jumping back to digital for a minute, though, you mentioned audio books, and you're not you're not against an audio book. Sometimes when you're traveling, it's kind of helpful. You can mm -hmm. listen to it while you're doing something else. But you've been a big supporter, and I know a user of LinkedIn social audio, mm -hmm. uh, and we have Twitter Spaces and things like that. But I know you have almost sort of built a community and you're having really engaging live conversations in a social audio environment. How did you find that? Has that been helpful uh, for your, your overall strategy? Absolutely. And I think, you know, anytime you're on a platform, let's say like LinkedIn, and you are producing content, if you have built a group of people who, no better word, a tribe, right, that enjoy what you do, want to help support what you do and you're doing the same for them right that has huge benefits in kind of accelerating your content out there part of that for me was building through a lot of these audio events you know starting with clubhouse a few years back uh, when people needed to talk to somebody 
right? <laughs> and they needed to talk to somebody who wasn't at work. And, you know, I started a couple of different uh, groups on Clubhouse. The people that were in one group, which was Fab Foreign Friends, were probably the closest of anybody else I know on LinkedIn. And we can trust each other and we can help each other. And we've told stories about each other that, you know, we wouldn't tell anybody else. Uh, but the bonding that came from that was incredible. Now, you know, that's one side of it where it's more personal, right? We kept it in a small group. It never had more than probably 40 people. Um, but we told stories. We even had a kids club day where we would change all our pictures to children, right? What, what we looked like when we were five or 10. And we would tell stories about things that affected us as a child. Some of the stories that were told, I mean, amazing. The insights you get to into that individual that they would never have told you any, any other day, right? Or any other way, because it reveals a lot, right? But that connectivity, when you hear those things, what that does, you know, in your relationship is incredible. So I love that. And the other side of it is that, that more business side. We had a, an audio event uh, uh, yesterday where we talked about uh, chat GPT. And I like that AI assist and maybe even using it as a muse, I don't like it as a solution. And, you know, so I was kind of the, that side of it. Here's the legal ramifications. Here's what's going on. Here's how the content's repurposed. Here's how they're owning your content and giving it to others. So all those components, that's, that was my side of it when everybody else has been blowing the rosy smoke, right? And you've got to know anything that you go into you've got to have kind of eyes wide open, right? Open mind is good, but your eyes have to be wide open too. And you really have to understand what's going on, especially when it comes to technology. So that was, a, you know, the other side of that is talking more business or detail or, you know, uh, and, and being able to do it with people who don't necessarily agree with you, where you can have a conversation really and put things onto the table. Nobody gets upset. Uh, I have another individual who was in the group and we've been doing this for months on chat GPT. We like each other. We're friends. We don't agree <laughs> on this, you know, but it's okay. Cause they're like, Oh, you got me that time. I got you that. And you know, that's part of the process, but more people are joining into the conversation because of it. And they're realizing, Hey, they're still nice to each other. We can be too. We don't have to agree. And we're going to figure this out, you know, if we have open conversation. So I love that component. Uh, that was kind of a fun uh, event. Uh, had a lot of DMs that came in on LinkedIn. Oh, I, I loved what you were telling because nobody else has told me that before. And, you know, it was brave to put it out there. I didn't think it was. <laughs> I just thought it was something I knew. Yeah, uh, but that right. share, you know, you don't get that in other ways. And so there's something about audio. There's something about video. Changes that whole communication level. You know, if it were a post, and somebody had a, a, a dissenting agreement or dissenting opinion, and you're going back and forth. It's not the same. It's not a conversation. People don't see that you do care about the other and you're there to learn from each other, right? And so that's what I love about those kind of things. No, I, th I really appreciate that. And I, I think you, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, but I think you touched a really important point there, which is it's okay to disagree and stay friends. Yeah, you know, that's yeah. so important, isn't it? You know, some of my best yeah. friends, I don't agree with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But look, talking about, um, talking about friends and, you know, communities and, and things like that, you must have had people along your journey. Um, could be your childhood, could be somebody from, you know, that conversation you had a day or so ago, but you know, people that you admire, people that have inspired you, or people that you've looked up to along the way. When I ask you that type of question, what springs to mind, Kevin? Uh, you know, it, as far as the core of who I am, because I did grow up traveling, right, moving into different countries, even into different states in the United States. I had three states in high school, right? <laughs> so I moved a lot. My parents were kind of a core, right? And my parents were very different. My, my father and mother both came uh, through Ellis Island in the United States, immigrated into America, went straight to New York into uh, Hell's Kitchen, right? During that time, they were having the, uh, I guess, the Puerto Rican Italian riots where they're all fighting in the streets. They had trash cans thrown through their windows, that kind of stuff. They came a couple hundred dollars in their pocket. And they became reporters for Life Look, 
uh, Esquire, Time Magazine, and they also became illustrators for them. And then, you know, to watch them grow in what they did. So, you know, both really dynamic parents. My mom could fly a pontoon plane before she could drive a car, you know, so love that. She would tell you stories, you know, that you would just be in awe of as a kid that moms normally don't tell, right? And my dad was on the same same side. I remember growing up, uh, uh, he was very involved in aerospace. Uh, he actually got involved in a national association for space and then got involved with Stanley Kubrick for uh, 2001. And all the, the felt pen sketches in 2001 are my dad's. So he did all those sketches that they're pretending to sketch while the guys are in the, the isolation chamber and that kind of stuff. He designed the space station because of his knowledge being in that area. So things like that, very, very inspiring parents. And what was nice, you know, I had a brother and two sisters were all very different. And my parents encouraged that differences, you know, in what we wanted to do. I don't know how they did it but they did. And, you know, we travel with them. So, you know, they're taking us to different countries and we're growing up and, you know, all the things that go with that, they're, I guess, a big piece of who I am. And, you know, I, I owe a lot to them in that sense. So, uh, you know, I, that's an I, incredible kind of corny to say, I, you know, the most I owe is to my parents. They are my inspiration always have been now they both recently just passed, but they got into their nineties late 90s. So, you know, very happy. They had a great life, you know, surrounded by family and, and you know, sometimes it's time to go on to the next journey, right? So they did. Um, but uh, they taught me a lot. You know, I remember on Sundays, uh, my dad would be making actually kind of an English uh, uh, breakfast with uh, spam, <laughs> of all things, uh, mushrooms, right, uh, eggs, just got all the pans going, making a total mess of the kitchen. And then he would have out in the living room, these big wharf tail speakers, you know, big box, cranking the beetles, right? And so we'd wake up to like good day sunshine and, <laughs> you know, and some stuff out of the revolver. And it was always loud, right? And we would come down and, you know, They'd be dancing and they'd grab us. And we're like, we just want breakfast. They make us dance with them. And then they would kick us out of the house, right? Because back then children were like chickens, right? Free range. <laughs> it's eight o'clock. Your dad and I want to do stuff. You're out. They kick you out the door, give you your bike and you stay out until the street lights come on, right? And when the street lights come on, you had to, you had to be in there before they noticed that the lights were on. And that was the day, you know, and fascinating, you know, the, that whole freedom and yet kind of a, a culture that they built with us, you know, that we didn't get anywhere else and we knew that. And so, you know, again, that becomes a big piece of my wiring. Kevin, it's incredible. It's an incredible story. I'm sorry to hear of their passing, but what great memories. What an incredible story that you shared with us there thank you so much for sharing that that's incredible really? and of course how could you not but be inspired and motivated by that i think that's a wonderful thank you for sharing that thank you thank you um just to uh not change gear too much but just take just to take that conversation into a slightly different direction then so there must have been specific advice ad specific advice um that you've picked up along the way now whether that was your parents or whether it was other people mm -hmm. but has there been any advice that you've you've taken to heart that has really stuck with you that you kind of live by today or is there any advice that you find yourself constantly sharing with people that you think look people need to know this this is really good advice and, and i think a lot of a lot of what i do share it comes from others right uh, i don't know if i can ever always pinpoint it right? Uh, you know, where that came from, but you know, you, you learn these things as you're growing and as you experience business and everything else, you perfect them. Um, but my biggest advice I can give anybody is networking always beats not working. It isn't easy, but it's a lot easier than not working. And what I mean by that is not like getting another job. I mean, keeping the job you've got, right? If you network, those opportunities will come. And so networking always beats not working 
That's the key. We forget to do that in many jobs, right? We put our head down, we're, I'm going to get this done. And we're not doing the networking component. And that's what ends up saving you when you need it. And you can't go and then find out you need it and generate it up really fast because then it's not real, right? Then it's like you're a burden as opposed to you've been doing this all along. You've been helping people. You've been talking to people. You've been understanding them. They've been understanding you. You keep that process going throughout your life. You never have to find a job. And I've had you know six pivots in my career and they've all been saved in the process or even created in the process through networking, through just talking with individuals, sharing things, helping them, you know, sometimes getting help for yourself, but it's, it's all in that networking process. And so that's, I think the best advice I can give anybody. I love that networking is better than not working. That's, that certainly should be printed on a t-shirt immediately. I like that. <laughs> um, so uh, when you look at the year ahead or you're planning the next three, six, nine, 12 months, what are you hoping to achieve, Kevin? What's on the roadmap for you? What's what's taking up the thought process? What are you thinking about? What's on the agenda? You know, a lot of what I'm, I'm thinking about is how technology is changing things, both good and bad, right? And it's where do you implement the good that it does, right? And be able to understand the downfalls in that process. So to me, I'm trying to figure out with a lot of the AI that's coming in is how can we, because we can't really stop it. How can we embrace it and use it in the right ways and then understand where it shouldn't be used because it's complicating things, you know? And so that's part of, uh, I guess it's always been part of my focus, but it's definitely now probably gotten a lot more pressure on it uh, because things like chat GTP are hitting the market hard and people are using it. Some of them are doing it right. Some of them are making mistakes. Nobody's really communicating what those are. And that's, I think, one of the things that's going to absorb a lot of my thought pattern. Yeah, it, it almost feels, uh, you know, from my perspective, at least, you know, just my two cents on it real quick would be that it feels as though we're entering another step change. Mm -hmm. The technology is, you know, if you thought it was speeding up already, you've it's almost like you haven't seen anything yet. Yeah. We seem to be going through this industrial 4.0 revolution pretty quickly, and it seems to be thundering down the tracks. Now, I could be completely wrong, but it feels very different at this moment in time for me. For people who maybe have lived through a, a few different changes, you were mentioning six different okay. pivots, and, you know, you've seen crashes and booms and busts, and we've we've been through that. But it, it feels as though technology is absolutely ramping up in lots of areas, and it's really um, reaching out into lots of lots of areas of our life, isn't it? Oh yeah, IBM's working on a program right now that could look at the videos that you're creating, it could watch those, and then recreate you, including your voice, including your humor, your tone, your tense, the whole thing, so you wouldn't even have to show up for these anymore. You could press a button, invite a guest, or maybe they'll invite their bot, <laughs> and then a conversation will be had. Most people won't know. The question is, should you do that? And yeah. if you do that, what do you really get from it? Besides content, right? Yeah, and I, I was fascinated. I mean, things like music, the music industry, we saw ABBA took a huge, you know, they sort of recorded it once in, in suits that tracked their body movement, but then ABBA... You know, there's a virtual live show of them every night playing yeah. out to packed, you know, packed houses every night. And this virtual human or this sort of AI driven, um, not only driving the the person and the voice, but driving the story, it yeah. is changing rapidly. Yeah. 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 So, you know, that to me is fascinating. Yeah. It's not going to stop. Right. So yeah. you've got to then understand what it is and make your decisions on how you're going to work with it or against it or whatever it is, right? And why, you know, but I think there's going to be a lot of changes in that sense. Yeah, no, for sure. That's that's a, that's obviously something that quite a number of people are now really focused on to mm -hmm. make sure that they are, 
ahead of the curve in the curve at least understanding the curve uh, because it is it is as i say thundering down the track so the other thing i wanted to ask you about uh before we we run out of time today kevin is i wanted to ask you is there anything else or is there any other area of what you do that maybe i haven't touched on that you want to share with our worldwide audience and i also want to make sure that I ask you to maybe share how people get in touch with you. If they want to find out more about the work that you do, the services that you provide, uh, I'm assuming LinkedIn is a given, but you know, where do you want to send people to? So, uh, you know, and, and LinkedIn is the easiest place to find me, right? Kevin D Turner, you'll find me right there. Um, it's, it's something that uh, I keep a lot of resources on my profile. There's a lot to kind of devour there. Uh, I am part of the uh, creator mode program, right? So you do have to follow me first, um, you know, but if we engage, I invite, or you can invite, you know, but let's build a relationship before we connect on LinkedIn, but that's where I am. And uh, even things like my phone number is there. Uh, you could call me and we could even start a conversation. So I try to make it really easy. I'm very open in that sense. I do stay busy. So sometimes it's hard to catch me, but I figure out times to do all that. Um, but one thing that is a passion for me is helping people on LinkedIn, helping them to understand what's going on on LinkedIn, how to use it, how to get the most from it, right? How not to be worried if you don't have the latest feature or how not to be worried that you're not using every single feature on LinkedIn, because it's absolutely absurd. They had over a hundred new features last year. That's one thing I do is I track them. I give examples of them. I do uh, gifts so people can kind of watch them through their process. Um, all of that I keep, you know, in a collection on my profile over the years. So it's all there. We even have a timeline for the invention of LinkedIn and all the changes. Love to share that information and love to get questions on it and talk about it. I give people credit. If they find something in the wild before I do, I put it right in there and I give them credit because that's community, right? So that's one area. The other area that I'm just recently kind of got involved in again is YouTube. I've had YouTube channels before, uh, just started one up for LinkedIn. It's called uh, Keep Rocking LinkedIn. That has grown dramatically in two months. And so within that, I've got a lot of videos to help people understand LinkedIn and understand LinkedIn in the way that nobody else is telling them. Things like, you know, since it is the world's largest database of resumes, how are those resumes processed? How do you fit within the database so that people can find you, right? So kind of using database best practices, using market value filters, how do you then stand out so that when somebody calls in and they go in there and they look for somebody, they're getting you as a top choice, really a product on LinkedIn is what you are. Uh, nobody likes to think of it that way, but we are LinkedIn's product. They sell us, right? $15 billion company, 65% of the annual revenue is selling members to other members. That's it. So if you can become the perfect product, and that's what I try to help people do for what they do, then they're always going to be found highest in the searches. They're going to get the most opportunity. And that's one of those things that I do on that YouTube channel as well, is help people understand that bit by bit. So you don't have to try to swallow the whole pill, because if you do, you'll choke, right? There's too much. I would hate to be a newbie on LinkedIn right now because there's just too much, right? I've been lucky to have the exposure and to learn as it grew. I wouldn't want to be thrown in there and say, learn everything, you know, because you can't. You just, you just got to wing it a little bit or find some guidance. And that's what I try to do is give that guidance. Well, that's great. And with a hundred changes last year alone, plus I'm not quite, I don't know how many years it's been out in the wild. Okay. Uh, We've already had how many years since Microsoft got involved. Pardon? We've already had 23 and 25 days. Wow. That's incredible. Now, they're smaller. They're not huge, but every one of them is an opportunity, right? Yeah. And so uh, if you don't know they're there, you can't take advantage of the opportunity. Well, look, that brings us nicely to the end of this episode today with uh, Kevin D. Turner. Make sure you check him out on LinkedIn for sure and on his new YouTube channel. Uh, thanks to everybody uh, for watching and listening to this episode. Thank you for Kevin for sharing his insights and wisdom with us today. And make sure that you like, follow, subscribe, do all the normal things you do for a podcast. We would sure appreciate it. And I hope that you'll join me back here for some more discussions with creatives, leaders, and thinkers. So thank you, Kevin. It's been a pleasure to catch up with you again, my friend. Thank you. Take care, Simon. Bye-bye.